Hey folks, Quilly Dean here, and I'm on a plane, but literally, probably, when this video is live, I will be in the air on the way to uh, Southern California uh, from, uh, from Northern Ontario, and um, I thought, hey, what a great excuse to crack out the flight simulator again. I can talk about the trip a little, and we can talk about the game, and, you know, just have a bit of a leisurely thing. I'm recording this in post, so um, I can just sit back and relax and talk. I've realized... Flying and talking is actually a relatively difficult thing to execute correctly, so I figured it'd be an easier thing to just simply do in post. So this is a uh, prepare. I'll talk about the uh, the trip and the fan meet and stuff in a moment. Let's talk about the game here. Uh, this is prepared or prepare 3D maybe from uh, Lockheed Martin. It's actually really it's Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, somewhat souped up, uh, and it's technically it's technically not a game. It's just something for academic purposes. Um, because of the thing. Uh, would I recommend this game? I don't know. It is by far my favorite flight simulator, uh, this Prepare 3D, and yet it's hard to justify now that there's a redo or an updated version of Microsoft Flight Simulator on Steam that tends to go on sale for a very cheap price, and also X-Plane being on Steam. Um, they're all very, very, very good sim simu flight simulators. Microsoft Flight Simulator is very cheap and has a lot of add-on support. By that extension, so does Prepare 3D, because it's basically flight Microsoft Flight Simulator. Many of the add-ons work in here, although not all of them. Um, this, uh, I, I'm running with some add-ons. I'm running with the FTX Global add-on, FTX Vector as well, to make the landscape a little prettier. I do have the Rex sort of weather cloud thing. Um, I have bought it, but I don't actually have it installed right now. This is a, a reinstall, and it's kind of a pain to install, and honestly, I'm not sure how much value I get out of the the, the nicer looking weather, for example, um, given the sort of difficulty and extra setup time uh, for that. So basically, it's just that. And then today, I am fly flying the uh, Beechcraft Baron 58, which is one of the airplanes that is included in prepared 3D. Um, I do have a few extra, like, uh, paid-for airplanes, but I have to say that one of the things that's nice about the planes that are included in the flight simulator is that while they, they there are a few details here and there that they don't include, they are much better on the frames per second. Like, for example, the A2A simulator, um, like Cessna 172 or 182, for example, have, like, crazy better uh, aerodynamics and engine simulations and all these things, and it really does kill the frame rate quite a bit. Although, right this second, I'm actually not getting ter uh, terrific frame rates. You can see in the top left corner. And the reason for that is normally I fly in relatively low population area, so I have all the scenery details cracked to the max, like all the autogen buildings and trees and all those things. And right now, I am flying out of LAX, Los Angeles... Uh, international airport, I suppose, and um, it turns out there's a lot of buildings in LA, and especially as I take off here, I'm pretty sure my frames per second are going to drop below 10 um, until I get a little further away from the city and a little bit over the water, for example. But yeah, um, so uh, but I quite like this plane. I like the planes that are a little. I mean, a a little simpler in that I don't necessarily know how to operate all the fancy machinery on the heavy uh, hardware. Now, it's a little deceptive because really, like, if you get a flight simulator and they include, like, I don't know, a, something that's equivalent to a 727 Boeing, like, big jumbo jet kind of thing, um, really they're actually not going to have most of the things in there unless you pay for one of the standalone versions, which are pretty expensive because those simulations are really, really intense to develop. Like, you'll pay the price of a full game uh, for a single plane, but that's because there's so much that goes into that particular uh, plane, just the, the avionics, the electronics, all the buttons and everything, for example. So, um, but, but I like playing the planes that are a little smaller and also a little older. Like, technically, I can pull up a GPS on this plane because they've got, I don't know, I can't remember what the key is, you know, like, Shift 3 or something like that, I can pull up a GPS. But there's something about navigating with just the, uh, the VOR, for example, you know, Nav 1, Nav, Nav 2 kind of thing that I've always found very, very enjoyable. And I think it's because when I started playing flight simulators, um, way back when, way, way, way back when, um, there really, there was no GPS stuff in the flight simulators, and in fact, they shipped with tons and tons of paper maps, and you would find your position by tuning into two different nav beacons, finding out what radial you're on, and actually, like, tracing it out on paper, and, you know, triangulating, and then tracking things that way, which is always a hell of a lot of fun. But yeah, here it is. Um, I haven't flown this, uh, Beechcraft Baron 58 too many times. Um, it is nice to be going with the, um, 
the twin prop engine, the, the multi-engine plane here, which is this is. These are just the uh, twin uh, piston engines, like the same sort of engines you might find in a car, more or less, right? Just regular engines, but instead of turning wheels, they're simply turning propellers, more or less. Um, I also play some uh, some turboprop planes. I've got uh, I've got a Metroliner three that was an extra download, um, and it's interesting. I always talk about the Metroliner three plane is. It's like you're, you're flying it in the simulator and it's a terrible plane, but that's because it's a terrible plane in real life. It's terrible as a passenger and it's pretty terrible as a pilot in a sense too, but it is fun to sort of deal with that terribleness. Um, the, uh, the Metroliner 3 is what one of the local airlines uh, here in town, like the very domestic flights, uh, Bearskin Airlines, they use for that, and I've been a passenger in it, and it's, I, I did not enjoy it. And but it was funny because I like looked it up, and there's something about flying a plane that is the same as you flown in. And um, there was a pretty decent simulator by like Raz Dam, Raz Ban, or something like that for it. Which uh, so I've got that. Maybe I'll do a video for that at some point. But here I am, finally taking off. I've got all my radios set up. You can see me pull up uh, one of the, the the chart sites that I use to to plot my flights there. And, we're finally going to go ahead and depart. I do use the um, the built-in air traffic control system, the radio system, a little bit. But one of the things with LAX is the airspace around LAX is one of the most complex airspaces in the world. And I'm not really going to do the for real, you know, class... I don't remember what's here, B, C, N, D, airspace transition, and listen to all those rules or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, so I'll make a token effort at the radio, but some of those those airspace transitions are just way too complex for me. So, yes, yeah, so here we are leaving LAX, and actually, I should bring up my, my chart, because unless I am wrong, like, the way I visualize it, and I don't really know the LA area, right, but in the way I visualize it, LAX is, what, slightly northwest of LA proper? I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it up on my map here. I mean, I don't know what you would call LA proper. The problem with Los Angeles is that it's a relatively distributed city, or spread out city. Okay, not northwest, I, I guess west, right on the coast, west, but you know, most, I'm most likely I'm looking at this map here, and it's probably bits to me that look like LA on the map that I'm looking at right this moment are probably not LA. They're probably some other sub-city inside of Los Angeles. Um, but whatever, you know, for, for, for what everyone else considers to be, you know, that sort of area. So LAX is on the western side, and uh, there's quite a bit to fly over. And I'm going to be, by the time, so again, when you're watching this video, I'm going to be most likely in flight to LAX. But then shortly after that, I will be getting in a cab and going just a bit south to Newport Beach just outside of LA and uh, I might have made I can't remember I, I think at some point I was like oh man I should look for maybe where Newport Beach is in here um, but I, I don't think I have any chance of actually spotting it I don't know the area that well um, but it is it is closer so I'm flying south on this flight here that you're seeing um, I'm flying south I'm gonna be landing at San Diego International Airport and when I first saw that I was like okay is this one of those there's so many airports in the United States that call themselves international airports because technically you can like fly to Mexico there or something like that. And I was looking at the map and I mean, I don't, again, I don't know this area too much. And I saw that San Diego International Airport was a single runway airport. And I was like, oh yeah, it's just one of these that just calls itself international, but really everyone flies to LA, through LAX. And I actually think that LAX is where most, you know, big international flights really do go. But apparently uh, San Diego is the busiest single runway airport in the United States and is actually the second busiest single runway airport in the world, second to, oh man, I, I, I want to say something like Gatwick or something like that, um, it's something in the UK. So it's like, okay, it's a pretty legit, even though it's one runway, it's it's actually a pretty big and legit airport. Uh, oh, here you can see my, my frame rate hovering, you know, freakishly close to like 10 frames per second here as uh, I look at the window and there's so many buildings being popped in by the... Um, uh, by the the train generator, the building generator. So next time I fly this area, I'll probably just disable the buildings. In these flight simulators, I find there's only two viable options. Either you have the building autogen to max, or you turn it off completely and just rely on the fact that the actual terrain texture beneath you has, you know, has buildings. Like, you know, and, and, and the thing is, even if you have your autogen turned on, if you go high enough, then you're, you're beyond a certain distance, the autogen will turn off, and you'll just see the... Um, you know, you'll just see the the surface texture, which looks like buildings, just fine. It, it, that that effect doesn't work if you're literally on the ground, but um, you know, it, it's fine. So, 
I, I just don't like the mix. I don't like, you know, having three or four buildings randomly pop out of the train. I think that makes no sense whatsoever. So it's an all or nothing proposition with me with the autogen buildings. So in this area, I'll probably just turn them off. It's the same thing when I fly into or around uh, London Heathrow, for example. I just turn off all the autogen stuff so that I have any frame rate whatsoever. So my plan here was to fly mostly like along the coast and you know get a neat experience as I just follow down there. I mean visually it's very easy to just sight my way along the coast and not have to worry about um, any sort of compass bearings or anything like that but I think right about this time I'm like you know I think I'm more or less gonna just uh, stay on the current vector that I'm on here and just slowly make my way over the ocean and make a bit of space between me and the hardware crippling scenery. You can change the autogen settings when you're in mid-flight, that's perfectly fine, but I didn't want to bother, so I was like, yeah, it's, it's okay. I mean, um, it, it sucks to have poor frame rate when you're, when you're landing, mostly. But for the rest of things, it's actually, it's mostly fine, because, you know, um, if you're trying to level out or, you know, get straight and level or something like that, then it can be a little bit rough, but other than that, it is fine. I don't believe at this point I am using, no, I'm not using the autopilot at all at this point. Um, I'm just, you know, using trim and whatnot. It is a, a fairly calm day, fairly calm weather. Every now and again, as I go through, a, like, a certain sort of, um, I don't know what you'd call it. You know, you, you go up through a certain layer in the atmosphere, then there might be a bit of a crosswind and things get a little bit crooked and stuff. But at this point, I've got it trimmed. Uh, I was aiming for 4,500 feet above uh, sea level here. But, um, and, and I, I got kind of lazy. I got to, I don't know, I don't remember where it was. I got just short of 4,000. I was sort of like trimming to a relatively modest vertical speed at that point. Um, so I'm just slowly drifting up to 4,500, which is really not the way you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to, you know, your target, your, your altitude, get there because there's you know certain altitudes are are kind of magic numbers to avoid collisions so you're supposed to get there at a relatively reasonable clip and then just level off from there but here I was doing the lazy thing of oh, I'll just casually drift there and then sort of freeze things off you can see me a moment ago I was checking the the DME the distance measuring equipment I think that's what it stands for um, it's kind of neat actually like if you ever read up even if you don't want to play flight simulators but you like you know any sort of engineering or technology or anything like that read up on the radios and, and other sort of devices that planes use to navigate. It's, it's stunning. And it's incredible to think about how well this works, given how old a lot of this uh, stuff is. Like, the way that the, the sort of VOR nav beacon type of technology works is pretty crazy. Like, you know, you've got a tower that's putting out a radio signal. It's like, okay, that's fine. Things put out a radio signal. And actually, the very first thing that came out was... Um, was it like sort of the ADF technology? And basically, you could tune that to, I think you could tune it to like any AM radio station, effectively. Um, and it had like, maybe, it had something like two receivers maybe, and it could tell the, the difference in gain between the two of them. So it could sort of tell you if you were going towards or away from something. And you could sort of, you could sort of do a bit of a rotational thing. So you could figure out exactly, if you tuned into that radio station, it would give you basically information as to um, what direction that was in. Okay, so you could sort of point the, the needle and like, oh, okay, it's, you know, it's just slightly to the right of me, so if I want to fly directly to it, I can do that, or, um, and that was a good way to navigate, actually, you could, you know, plot your way along various um, radio antennas along the way to your destination and be like, okay, so I'm going to fly um, with, you know, facing this antenna. Um, until I get on top of it. And as you go on top of it, your antenna, you know, if things go screwy and then it flips 180, basically. And then I'm going to tune to the next antenna and fly towards it and so on and so forth. But the, uh, the, the nav beacons, the, the VOR stuff is crazy because not only can your system sort of tell, you know, in a sense, if you're pointing towards it, but it actually will tell you what radial you're actually on. So, um, you know, you might be flying dead north and it will tell you, um, in, in a sense, currently you're this many degrees off and this many degrees off or what you can do is you can say listen i want to be coming in at exactly i want to be flying directly east into this thing and right now i'm flying north well it'll show you sort of a little line and you can sort of see it in the middle here that yellow line in the middle is like my deviation of the radial i have my vor turned to and it's like all frequency and weirdness and then you read up about how like ils works and it's it's even crazier um, anyway, I think I was supposed to be talking about this trip a little bit. Yeah, so um, I've mentioned it in a few other videos, and I'm just going to mention it again uh, so that you know people know I'm going to I'm going down to Newport Beach to visit the In Exile Studios. Um, that's the sort of Brian Fargo and well other great people sort of studio um, that have uh, well right now they're working on a game called Bard's Tale Four, 
And obviously they were involved with Bar Tale 1 through 3. And also, there was a game, was it like 2002 or something that came out that was just called Bard's Tale? And it was sort of set in the same, I don't know, universe and theme, but it was pretty substantially different. Bard's Tale was like one of the original sort of RPG, very Dungeon Dragons inspired, you know, go up, build a party and then sort of work your way down some sort of labyrinth or maze or something like that. Um, at, with your party and uh, it it was inspiration for a lot of different games and one of the other things that uh, these guys did was a game called Wasteland which assuming I'm remem remembering the order of things properly um, they wanted to make a sequel to Wasteland ages and ages ago but I think there were problems with like the sort of copyright or trademark like you know the company that owned the trademark for Wasteland it sort of went by the wayside or people moved or you know there's something like that so they couldn't use the Wasteland name again um, so they decided to make a uh, Wasteland 2 but with a different title and the title they chose was Fallout yeah so you know these are the same people responsible for for Fallout and in fact the game that came before Fallout uh, and so on and so forth and uh, when you play um, they, and anyway recently they've um, and I think so these are people that had you know various companies and work for different people and whatever but since forming in, ex in exile one of the things they did is they were one of the first companies to do like a big successful Kickstarter and I think the first one they kickstarted was Wasteland 2 a true Wasteland 2 and if you play it it'll be re very reminiscent to the original sort of Fallout 1 or 2 or in fact the original Wasteland and this is an exceptionally good game um, and they've also kickstarted a new um, uh, Planescape Torment thing I think I've got that right and now they've kickstarted their Bard's Tale 4, and they seem to do a pretty good job. I've, you know, I get emails all the time, you know, about Kickstarters and like, hey, you should make a video about this Kickstarter. Whether from just, you know, fans and viewers, but more often than not, it's the companies themselves. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if you're ever going to deliver. I mean, Kickstarter, like, you know, so many things you put on Kickstarter that don't really go anywhere or don't really deliver what was promised. Um, but this, these guys clearly know WTF they're doing. Um, because they've done it before. They've been in the industry for like 30 years and they've done the Kickstarter model before and it's worked very well. Um, and yeah, so they seem to be putting together some pretty good stuff. And so um, I was, they, when they when they contacted me about, hey, uh, you know, we're doing this, this live stream, this Kickstarter, and we were talking about live streaming and doing an event, would you like to play host for us? And I was like, yeah, that, that, okay, I could probably do that. Now I assume they just wanted me to stream something from here, call them on Skype. And then they were like, yeah, yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll fly you down to to Newport Beach, California, so that you could be here in person. I was like, oh, oh, okay, sure. That's that's new to me, but sounds very, very, very exciting. Um, and frankly, I think we're a pretty good match because, uh, well, I actually haven't played very much. I've, I've dabbled with the um, the original sort of three Bard's Tale and as well as the, the sort of 2002 3D Bard's Tale adventure game variant, um, as well as Wasteland 2. I actually never loaded up. I never played the original Wasteland, but I have played Wasteland 2. So I'm, I'm a big fan of what they're doing, and, and you know, also just a big fan of D&D &D and RPGs and stuff like that. So it's like, I think we could probably make this pretty awesome. I think we can have a pretty good time. So hopefully, all of this will work out. Um, you know, especially, like, I'm flying out there. I'm flying out there for an afternoon's worth of live streaming, and then, as it turns out, my flight, uh, I, I will have one day to sort of putz around in Newport, so I'm make, doing a fan meet while we're there, so if you haven't heard about it already, on Saturday, July the 11th, yeah, at 4 p.m. Pacific time, we'll be meeting up in a, a sort of a brew pub place, I think it is, and hanging out, having some snacks, maybe having some beers, and just, you know, chilling. Um, there's a link down below to the Facebook event, if you can please RSVP for it, that would be really handy, so that I can tune the reservation to the correct amounts. It sounds like it's probably going to be a bit of a, of a smaller event, you know, just maybe a half dozen people or so, and that's going to be really nice. We'll hang out, we'll, we'll nerd out, we'll talk about video games, it'll be really cool. But yeah, so there's going to be this live stream for, um, for Bard's Tale, and obviously, you know, there's a business relationship going on here, you know, full disclosure and all things, but I'm, I'm really excited for it. I've never done anything quite like this before, and I think the game is going to be... I, I'm very excited for it. I think it's going to be the sort of thing I'm very, very interested in. Um, I think... Because, I, I, again, I've seen the first, you know, the first three original Bard's Tale, which came out in, like, the 80s for the, the Apple II and the Commodore and that sort of thing, um, and that's certainly a bit dated, and I think what we're going to get here is going to be something that's going to be maybe a little bit... It, it's certainly going to be more modernized, but it's still going to have that sort of hardcore... Um, just tactical, strategic RPG-style combat, which is nice. Oh, I've just put on the autopilot. I think uh, I think I'm about to take some screenshots. 
trying to take some screenshots, and you gotta have the autopilot on for that. Spend a little bit too much time outside of the cockpit. Things look lovely. Here's, I mean, these are the default clouds in uh, Prepare 3D, and I think they're fine. I realize it's not, you know, terribly realistic weather, but again, I've messed around with Rex in the past, and it does look very, very nice. But it's it's some amount of work, and then if you want to play and you want to change what the weather is, it's got to generate all these textures again. So you're like, I want to fly now, and you're like, oh hold on, I got to wait 10 minutes for for the the weather to get updated or the weather graphics to be updated, and it's just a little bit wonky. And I'm I'm fine with playing with the uh, the built-in weather. I am happy to have the upgraded terrain textures. I think they look really nice again. That's the the Orbex FTX global global vector stuff. That is pretty handy dandy. Although I did, um, I did have to like reset up my whole my whole install of everything here because um, I deleted it to make some room. I hadn't been playing the flight simulator in a while, so I reinstalled with the latest version of Prepare 2.5, and I didn't realize they changed some of their um, some of their their folder structure. So there's like some updates and things I had to grab to make everything work again. Oh yeah, you know I was talking about the DME earlier, and I forgot to like finish that. I started talking about radios, but the DME is a system whereby it can actually tell you how far away you are from a radio tower and also basically keep track of like how fast you're approaching it i mean if you're not going straight at it then your approach speed is not going to match your um your airspeed or anything like that but it still gives you a good sense of what's going on in fact i think when i took off on this flight i first had one radio tuned to a tower that was basically right near lax because the tower near my target at um San Diego International, I was out of range to it, so I wouldn't be able to grab an actual signal. So what I think I did, and you guys, I, I've got my thing on mute here, but what I did is I, I tuned one to, you know, nav one and another to nav two, so you have two of these tuned at any given time. And I think I, I turned it on, there's, um, it's kind of neat. The All these radio beacons actually do broadcast a certain sound, and specifically they actually broadcast a, um, a Morse code. So you can, and you can enable that speaker. So I, the radio I had tuned to the San Diego tower, I had that speaker on so that I would hear the beeps of the Morse code once I got into range, so then I can change my radio, for example. Um, yeah, I was, I'm tuned into uh, to Mission Bay 117.8, and the Morse code for it is um, it's dash dash space dash dash dot dot dash dot dot dot. So if you go back to when that, that hit, you would have heard beep beep, 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 beep. And, you know, probably heard that repeat a couple of times before I just muted it. If you, yeah, if you go back and watch that. So it's it's neat, you know? It also confirms that you're tuned to the right thing if you're listening to that. And, of course, these days, you can just use GPS for everything. Again, I, I don't remember if I've put it up in this video or not, but even on this plane, which doesn't actually have GPS on the console, uh, in the simulator, they let you pull up a GPS. That's actually one of the things I like. Oh, there we go. See, taking screenshots, putting them in, in the Photoshop. Um... One of the things I like about uh, the A2A simulation um, Cessna is they actually give you a few different configurations in ra your radio stack. You can have um, your setup without any GPS, the setup with like the GPS built into the dashboard, or the setup that I love the most actually, where you don't actually have the GPS as part of your, your actual sort of dashboard or console. Instead, it's like got one of those suction cup things stuck to the window. It's like, it's just like being in a car, you know, you just have your GPS to the window. Of course, um, the avionic GPS is different from the car GPS. Obviously, the air one doesn't really have road information the same way, but it actually has information about all the airports, what the runways are, frequencies, that sort of thing. It's pretty handy because you can always like pull up like, hey, what's the nearest airport? Go through the list there and like pick it and then like find out what the radio signal is so you can contact them and be like, guys, I'm screwed. Can I land at your thing? That sort of stuff. But uh, I don't know. I still... When I play these flight simulators, especially in these these small general aviation planes, I, I really like the sort of more manual thing, which is interesting. Yeah, I was supposed to put the prop sink in on uh, right after takeoff, um, which is interesting because um, in so many other things, I like a lot more automation. But on these short flights in these tiny planes, if you automate it, then you're really like, what's the point of it all? Whereas what, what happens when you play the big planes, like if you buy one of the really, really good... Um, big heavy you know airliner planes you know like like uh, a, one of the big Boeing planes or an Airbus plane you know an A320 I think you know those you know the, the things you would fly in if you were going overseas or even you know any passenger plane that fits you know more than more than a couple of dozen people for example they are very very heavily automated you've got uh, a flight computer basically where you punch in every aspect of your route 
uh, ahead of time before you take off. You're like, well, we're going to take off here. We're going to climb this many feet. Then we're going to turn towards this beacon and climb towards 15,000 feet. Then we're going to turn towards this other beacon and climb up 35,000 feet. Then we're going to go to this waypoint, this waypoint, this waypoint, and now we're across the Atlantic. Then we're going to go to this waypoint, this waypoint, turn here, turn here, turn here, turn here. And of course, we've got the auto landing feature and we will land automatically at this runway. Because when you're flying those big planes, you're not it's not the like you know pulling on the yoke and the joystick that's the actual challenge it's the managing the ridiculous amount of systems that all have to work together to make this thing fly through the air and yeah um you know you can fly it manually and in fact the way i understand it many pilots will tend to still do the landing manually just because they can keep their skills sharp um, if there's ever a problem, they have to do it, for example. You know, so they, they do something like the last thousand feet or something on manual. Um, but you can land it completely automatically the whole way. And that's, you know, that's kind of cool. But working out the technology, like, that's the challenge. So the challenge is not being able to, like, use your, your joystick to keep your plane level and land not too hard. It's, okay, I've got 35 buttons to push in the exact correct sequence now, and I have to go and do that. And that's, you know, that's cool. Or, you know, and in the simulator, again, and one of the other things that's fun is, is going through all your checklists and making sure everything is correct. And you're, you're playing pilot. And uh, it, is, it is pretty super serious. Plus, there's actually a lot of great ser uh, services online where you can get actual real-time um, um, air traffic control. There's these, these websites. And um, I'm trying to remember. There's, there's a few of them. And I don't want to say, like, the wrong name for one of them. One of them is VATSIM. I've got that one off the top of my head. And the others don't don't come to me. Probably if you check the uh, the comments down below, someone will um, someone will fill in the blanks there for some more of these. And some of them are even free, which is amazing. And uh, basically, like you have a, a bit of a plugin in your program that um, that lets them effectively see you on their radar. So you can play you can play air traffic controller and track people on the radar and you're going to be on like a voice chat system where people can radio into you and say you know oh i'm requesting requesting a landing it's such and such a thing you have to look and be careful about like all the other flights in your particular system and, and maybe coordinate things and you know i mean <coughs> excuse me in a sense it's all a big game of make make believe um it's you know it's role playing and yet that's also where a lot of the fun in a lot of games are. And in particular, a lot of people use this as, as a bit of a soft training tool. Even if they never have the intention of ever becoming a commercial pilot, they might have some desire to fly a little bit. And, you know, how many people really get to fly a giant airliner with 250 passengers in there? Um, and certainly not, you know, without years and years of experience. And this is a way to, you know, maybe get that started or at least scratch that itch. You can see uh, while I'm out here, like, the, the frame rate is, like, well above 60 at this point. Because there aren't all those crazy LAX buildings, or LA buildings, I suppose I should say, around here. Um, yeah, even if I pan over to the coast, you can see the frame rate is still tremendously good. And even if I were above LA, but I was, you know, more than 10 or 20,000 feet above it, the frame rate would also be stupendous. It's just the uh, the production of the buildings. Oh, here I am, I'm looking at my landing spot. I'm like, it's somewhere right around there. There's a bit of a peninsula. It's actually really confusing. I did this, uh, this flight and um, there's two airports basically right next to each other. And as you're making your turn, you're like, uh, which one's mine? But again, one of them has a single runway and like, oh, that's the one I'm looking for. San Diego only has one runway, so I guess that's the one I want. I wasn't landing with um, ILS or anything like that. I'm assuming San Diego International provides I ILS, but I wasn't using that. ILS is an in instrument landing system. Um, and basically, just like a lot of the other things where it tells you, you know, if you're, you know, your destination is to your right or to your left, this does that, but with a far greater precision, but much less range, um, as well as giving you a vertical information. It's got a, something, you, your plane might have something called a glide scope, where it'll also tell you if you're coming in too low and too high. And basically, you can just point yourself to the middle of that cross and stay there, and it will guide you in to be exactly where you're supposed to be. The only thing you have to worry about is that you're not going too fast, for example, that, you know, you remember to put down your, uh, your landing gear um you can see here the atc well i guess you can probably hear it i have it muted right now while i record this but um there's another plane out there the the beach uh 58 tango which is on i'm, I'm doing um a vfr flight visual flight rules or visual flight reference oh there we go i finally brought up the uh, the gps um but some people are doing an instrument flight there that basically they're getting um 
they're not counting on being able to see anything so they get tied into the air traffic control which tells them everything about they, they register their flight plan they get coached through things um, they get guided based on you know the the traffic tower the traffic control towers routing these planes whereas I'm mostly left to like as long as I don't get in anyone's way I don't really get routed the same way especially not in the flight simulator um, you know I might get told to enter a traffic pattern and, and certainly I'm expected to obey certain altitude rules, but I'm not going to be coached and handheld all the way. And um, and the thing is, the, the one where you get coached and handheld all the way is actually a much harder sort of flight class to get um, certified for, right? Um, because, I don't know, I, I, it implies a lot of other things, I think, about what kind of planes you're doing and, and following those instructions. And I think, I don't know, there's probably fees or something. I actually have no idea how that works. That can't possibly be a free service. So does your like airline register with it or something? I don't know. One day, one day I'm gonna do a discovery flight and fly around for real in a little bit of a plane. So yeah, these things are called discovery flights. You like pay a hundred bucks or a couple hundred bucks maybe to go up in a small plane with someone. Like, you know, they, they pilot and you sit in the passenger seat or the co pilot seat or whatever. Well, these little planes don't really have co pilots really. Although I guess they do have a yoke on the other side. So yeah, so you sort of sit in the co pilot seat and theoretically I think they're supposed to just, you know, take you up and fly you around. But I as I understand it for a lot of them, you can you can put your hands, you know, on the controls for a little bit and just try things out and get a feel for and uh, um, I, th I think I will do it at some point. I was, I was doing a lot of Flight Simulator in the winter, and I said, well, I didn't want to do that in the winter. But if I still weigh into it come the summer, then I'd do it. Uh, I did fall off it for a few months, so I'm not going to go and do it yet. But at one point, I think it would be really quite awesome. I know that flying is an expensive hobby. I mean, buying a plane by itself is pretty pricey. Although, I don't think it's quite as expensive as you might expect. Like... I think um, getting something like a Cessna type plane, I, I don't know, ex I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head like exact numbers, but I'm pretty sure you're talking about something like, you know, a, a pricey car, but not a ridiculously expensive car, and certainly less than a house, for example. So I, I, I can't remember, I think there's something like that, but that's just a buy, then you gotta, like, you're, you might be, you might be storing it, you might be parking it at an airplane, airport, so you're paying some storage fees there, and I think you pay quite a bit uh, for your fuel, so these things kind of add up, but I don't know, it would be kind of awesome. I don't think I'd ever actually buy it myself, but guys got a dream, right? I think I'd be much more likely to buy a, a plane than a boat, for example, right? I actually used to work for a boat manufacturing company. I worked in IT, I was like, you know, designing accounting software and working on their website and making, um, uh, intranet sites for the dealer networks that they could order more, you know, wholesale boats and that sort of thing. A job I actually enjoyed quite a bit. Um, and these were not big boats. These were, you know, just your your 20-foot boats with the outboard motor, and people would take them on lakes to go fishing. You know, they weren't they weren't yachts. They weren't sailboats. They weren't anything like that. They'd just be like, you know, you can fit the uh, you, your spouse, your three kids, and a dog, and go fishing on a little lake, kind of a thing. And those things, especially like the boat themselves with the default engine wasn't so bad, but if you really wanted a, a decent motor on there, they would quickly add up to like thirty or forty thousand dollars. And I was like, God damn, that's a lot to just go on the water. And I'm pretty sure for that price, I think you can buy an actual plane. And that's a hell of a lot more exciting to me. And probably one day, one day someone will be playing back this video and be like, yep, and then he died in a plane crash. Man, I should not be recording this before I actually fly in a plane, especially not making comments like that. I meant, you know, die in a plane crash in my own personal little Cessna 172 or something like that. Um, but yeah, I actually bought a lottery ticket the other day, which I don't normally do, but, um, you know, the lottery had gotten quite big. And one of the things that I like about the one lottery that uh, I bought the ticket for is they don't just let, like, the lottery prize just get bigger and bigger and bigger. They cap the max prize out, and then instead of, like, you know, so it goes from, like, 50 million to 60 million. No, they don't do that. They go 50 million and 10 $1 million prizes. And at this point, it's got, like, tons and tons of $1 million prizes on it. And it's just uh, just for, for Ontario. So I was like, ah, what the hell? I'll do it. And I bought this, and I won't know what the result is until the day after I leave on my trip. So I'm like, great, I've probably got this winning lottery ticket. I'm going to die in a plane crash, just like in that song, because that's the way things go, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to take a little sip of water here. And my water, I mean a beer. Um, see, this is the other reason that I didn't want to record and fly at the same time, because I knew I wanted to sit here 
with a beer and be pensive. I don't know what, what's going on with this video. I think these flight sim videos, if I do, you know, and I'm going to make them from time to time. A lot of people have actually been requesting a new one because it has been a very long time. I think they're all going to be like this. It's all going to be just me babbling nonsense because, listen, even on a short flight like this, you know, I, the total time in the air is about what, 30 or 40 minutes in real time. There's still, you know, there's a lot of time to just talk about whatever the hell. So I think what you guys should do, if you're still watching, well, first of all, kudos to you, my dedicated viewer. Um, what you should do is leave in the comments suggestions for what to discuss on future flights, what topics you would like to hear me just babble on brainlessly about. And maybe it's something I know a lot about, or maybe it's something I know nothing about, because that could be fun too. Uh, maybe I'll have to do some research, maybe I won't. We'll see how it goes. And um, if you've got ideas for flight that might only take you know, somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes, let me know. Find a couple of airports that aren't too far apart. Um, as I say, these planes, they all fly, um, it's, a little, it's a little different because there's like the takeoff time and climb time and different things like that, but you can expect that they go somewhere a little north of 100 miles an hour, effectively. So um, as long as the two airports aren't more than maybe 100 miles apart, then it would be a very nice length of flying for this. Um, alternatively, I could do a flight that's a little further apart and then cut the video ahead of time and then just talk over the the edited video where some of the more boring long parts have been cut out, for example. There are some mechanics in the game here to speed up the simulator, to accelerate the time between things. There's also mechanics to just instantly teleport between two points, so, you know, you could do a big uh, flight across the Atlantic, and, you know, after you've crossed, you've gone past uh, Ireland, then you just, like, whoop, fast forward over to Newfoundland and Canada or something like that, which is, you know, certainly possible if you're looking to do it, but one of these days, one of these days, I will have to purchase one of the proper simulators for the big ass planes spend uh, two or three weeks learning what all the buttons do and then try some of those big international flights I keep thinking uh, oh here here's a good thing on the right like actually right in the middle of that little I don't know what that rectangular doohickey is in the middle of that window but there's a, an airport over there um, that is not the one I'm looking for but the one that I'm straight straight looking for like if you go um, you see where it says N71FS on my dashboard? If you go just above the N, there's like a straight line there. That's the actual landing strip I'm going for. Not the one that is in the middle of the square thing in the middle of uh, my windshield near the compass, for example. That is the wrong airport. And luckily in this game, it wouldn't have been devastating if I landed at the right one. But luckily I was able to figure it out. And so that was nice. So I, here I am on final approach here. Not using ILS or anything. And as I was quite disappointed to find out, like, I'm used to all the airports or most airports having this thing where, like, these four lights. There are four lights! Um, and it's kind of interesting. It's another one of these, like, super low-tech solutions, right? It's actually, I believe it's actually an array of eight lights. And what they are, they're, like, angled at a specific angle. Um, you know, with, like, I don't know, little, just little boxes around them or something like that. So that you can only see the light if you're coming in at a particular angle and it's quite ingenious in that it goes from right to left and if you're if you're too high all the lights are going to be i believe white and then as you drop if you as you get closer to the correct angle for lighting starting from the right one of the lights will turn red then the other one will go red and if you've got two whites and two reds that's you're you're exactly at the right angle um the, the proper approach for the um for the airstrip for the landing for the landing, the runway, that's the word I'm looking for. And then if you dip too low, then they'll start to turn more and more red until you get like four red lights, in which case it's like, listen, bro, you're coming in way too low at this point. And it's a, such a simple piece of technology. There's nothing to it. Just some lights and then some little piece of cardboard or wood or metal or whatever to make sure that you only see the correct lights at certain angles. And, and it's brilliant. And this poor airport, I don't think had it, um, which was a little bit, it's a little bit disorienting to me. Uh, because I haven't done a lot of flights on the uh, the Beechcraft uh, Baron 58 here that I'm flying, and so getting that sort of instinctive feel for what the correct angle is is a little bit rougher. But um, I have gotten relatively okay, relatively okay at being able to just yeah visually sight the runway and get a sense based on you know the shape of the runway what my angle might be. Um, it's still not, not, certainly not perfect, and especially not without those additional aids, but yeah, I was like, what, where, where are my lights? Dude, where are my lights? Oh my god, where are my lights? But, uh, there we go, we're coming into, to San Diego. 
I don't know anything about San Diego, other than it's much closer to the Mexican border than I thought. One of the things that annoys me about California is I remember the first time I was going to, uh, to Mountain View, California, where Google was, which is basically where, where San Francisco is, you know, right around the corner from San Francisco. People asked me where I was going, and I looked at California, and I said, I'm going to Central California. Or someone said, oh, you're going to Northern California. And I looked at the map, and I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to Northern California. I'm going to, you know, Central California. Because San Francisco's right in the fucking middle of California. What the fuck? How on earth can that be Northern California? But apparently it is. Although in hindsight, I'm thinking about if anyone ever looked at a map of Ontario and I said I was in Northern Ontario, they'd be confused about that. But yeah, all right, so fine. I guess I'm, I'm assuming Southern California is the bit where it's like super populated. I know LA is Southern California and, and San Diego is Southern California and that's a lot of population. And then I guess anything North of that becomes Northern California. Fair enough, fair enough. But I will actually be in proper SoCal um, next week. And uh, that's very exciting. And here we are coming in, eyeballing my rough landing spot. I don't know where you're supposed to eyeball, but I'm like, I eyeball those, those stripey lines there. And I think that's right. It's like sort of, I sort of aim to throw my plane at that. And then right before I touch down, I pull back to flare, to burn off the last of the speed. And boop. Might have been, might have been a bit more of a final drop than uh, desire, but not too much more. And you can see I'm like, wow, my speed, my speed bled off right away. I guess I'm going to be able to come off on this taxiway. I had a lot of runway left. I don't think the little planes like me really land here at San Diego International. I think it's really m probably more of the big iron, but what do I know? But I felt, you know what, if I'm landing at one of these airports that probably just sees bigger planes than me, um, I may as well ask for a gate. Like you can you can get, you know, contact the uh, the ground, um, does it say ground tower? I don't know if that's the right, you know, ground control. Um, and you know, the, these small general aviation aircraft like this would just go probably to the parking or refuel or whatever. I'm like, no, no, I want a gate, just like a big boy. And they give me one. And taxiing to gate 36 via taxiway, Bravo 6 Bravo. And I missed the little signs, which was kind of annoying. Like, they don't tell you where to go until you're off the runway. And by then, like, the signs are all behind you. But luckily, the flight simulator does include something called progressive taxi, where it'll put these little yellow arrows on the ground to show where you're supposed to go. So I'm just turning to face those, and I'm going to, to go. Well, the other thing in uh, in real life, you would make sure to have uh, charts, little maps of your airports that you could uh, reference when you're given these directions. You can just look down at the paper chart, or actually all these guys. It's all um, it's all on tablets now. It's all on like iPads and whatever. And it's pretty incredible actually. And so they can just pull up all the airport charts there. And of course, I do have my second monitor. I could put a, pulled up the airport charts, but I was like, I'm gonna be lazy and just follow the yellow lines. The houses aren't bad, you know, relatively photorealistic-ish. A little flat, but, you know, it's not the end of the world. Oh, here I was trying to get a view where I was behind the airplane. I was like, which which camera view am I supposed to use for this? I'm sorry, I'm going to go through a few more of those. I thought this could rotate, but it doesn't. Just let me go back and forth. And finally, I think I figure out that it's the first exterior view that I can pan around there. It's just a lot easier, I find, to, uh, to taxi like this this way. Because... In, you know, in real life, you'd be able to turn your head around a lot easier to get a sense. I have, I have messed around with, I don't have track IR, I have the, uh, the no IR tracking one. I've used it before, and it actually, I've made a video about it, and it actually works pretty well, but I don't have it re reinstalled, and it's a little bit of work, and you've got to hold your head up, you know, stiffly, and I knew I was going to record this, and I didn't want to make it so that every time I looked at my second monitor, the whole camera view changed. That was no good, so, didn't have it, and as a result, um, it's harder to get more visibility in your cockpit, so it's easier to go third person view for these bits as I pull up to the gate. Anyway, I'm going to wrap up this video. Um, you know, I know it's a bit different than a lot of the others, but just, just a little something I want to do. Thank you very much for watching, folks, and I hope if you can make it out to the fan meets either in Southern California or Newport Beach or the one in Toronto the day after that, I hope you come out. They're always a blast. I'll see you there, and um, see you next time, folks.